Good morning, Heritage Bible Church. Hey, it is so nice to see people alive and not dead in this heat, right? <laughs> it is so good to be with you this morning. Would you stand as we begin our worship? I love what Psalm 63 says. It says, you, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. Oh, let's, let's, let's close our eyes and just read that line again. Because your love is better than life. Let's all pray that right now. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. Let's declare that. Can you repeat after me? I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. The next part says, I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. Isn't that good? He fully satisfies everything that we need. And we are singing to that God this morning.
close to you, when we really can, really, really can shout out your praise, uninhibited, and God, I can feel you moving in my own heart. Lord, our bodies sometimes groan with the waiting that we have to do to see you in your glory. But I thank you that we have, you've given us your word in the Psalms and the scriptures that you lead us by still waters. You quiet our souls. That you've gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. And if it were not so, you would not have told us. And what a great God you are to consider us. What is man that you would consider him? So, Father, we thank you for that great sacrifice that you made for us. That you took that cross and showed us what it was like to lay our lives down. And so, Lord, would you come around us with your Holy Spirit as we lay down our will. And we take up the, your yoke that is easy and light. So that we can worship you in truth. So let's sing, your name is the highest. Your your name is the greatest your name stands above in all thrones all thrones and dominions all powers and positions your name stands above them all and the angels and the angels cry holy all creation we thank you for your goodness and thank you for hearing our prayer lord that you love us so much we pray for the children as they're going to hear your word would you impress yourself upon their hearts so that they again move in your direction take steps towards you lord this morning that is our prayer as we lift up our kids to you and protect our time this morning lord as we um, greet one another and bind us and bind us in unity and we pray for our teacher as well that is going to be teaching our kids we lift them all up to you in your name, Father. Amen. So, uh, good morning again. If this is your first time here, we want to welcome you. It's very glad. I'm glad you're here. Uh, we have our teacher, Miss Victoria, right there, back there. She's in the middle aisle. And if uh, kids K through six will go with her, and once those little ones have squeezed out of the aisles, please stand and greet one another.
Well, good morning. Let me uh, go ahead and make just a few announcements before I share a couple of prayer requests with you, and then we look into God's Word and His message this morning. If you're a first-time guest with us, uh, we'd like you to stop by the information table in the social hall. We have a gift for you. Uh, we also have connection cards in front of you on the back of the chair. In case you have any prayer requests or questions or comments you have, you can fill that out. We will collect all of the connection cards at the end of the service. Okay. Uh, if you look in your bulletin, a couple of announcements just want to call your attention to. Uh, Young Families Impact Group is meeting today at 11 o'clock. That's up in the Frog Pond, uh, which... Uh, is uh, up above Noah's Ark. Uh, so, and if you don't know what all that means, ask your children, they know where the frog pond is, and they can take you there. So th their group is meeting. Uh, Wednesday night starts Aqua Devos for the youth group, which is uh, swimming and dinner and a Bible study. Uh, that'll be at the Newkirks this week, um, six to eight, okay? Um, I want to let you know that uh, prayer concern uh, we have is, is that about 10 days ago, I had the opportunity to visit uh, with Ken Johnson over at uh, Brookdale. He had uh, been in there in rehab after he had uh, experiencing a severe fall. And I was able to talk with him and share with him, and we prayed together. Uh, so that was about 10 days ago. And then a week ago, his son, Jay, uh, called me. Uh, and just to give me an update on Ken and to let me know that uh, the family had decided it was time to put Ken on hospice because he was uh, not doing well and, and declining. And, and I could see that when I visited with him. Uh, something positive that had occurred last Sunday is that last Sunday was Ken and Rita's uh, 58th anniversary. And so Jay was able to pick up Rita from Shafter at... Uh, a retirement home where uh, they had moved to before Ken uh, fell and had his accident. And so they were able to spend some time together last Sunday, being with one another, celebrating their anniversary. Um, and uh, when, when Jay had mentioned that they were putting Ken on hospice because of declining health, uh, they uh, were concerned because, I don't know if you know, their daughter Jenny uh, was, was in Romania as she served in Romania for many years. She was back at the orphanage helping run VBS a week ago. And, and everyone in the family was hoping that uh, she would be able to return home, hopefully before he had passed away. Uh, unfortunately, that did not occur because on Monday morning, Jay's uh, wife called me to let me know that Ken had passed away early Monday morning. Um, and so that was uh, somewhat of a surprise. It was quicker than, than many of us ex expected or had hoped. But, uh, and I, I mentioned as I talked with Jay's wife, I said, oh, you know, Jenny was hoping to, to make it home, you know, before he passed away. And she made the comment, she said, yeah, but all of the orphans in Romania, they're all taking care of Jenny. You know, and, and they're just caring for her in her absence. And so we want to be praying for the family. A graveside service has been scheduled. It, it's two or three weeks from now. It'll be at the end of July. In fact, uh, it, is, uh, it is scheduled for Friday, uh, July 26th at 9 o'clock in the morning at Hillcrest Cemetery. So it'll be a graveside service. Then there'll be a, a memorial lunch here uh, in our social hall at 11 o'clock uh, that morning. So we'll be praying for the family. Um, and uh, during this time and the grief and, and the loss, I received a, a text uh, this morning from Annie Martin. Uh, and I've received a couple of texts over the weekend. Uh, and there it is, okay? They found it, okay? This is the group that is in Arabia with Mission Multiply, uh, the mission group that is with uh, uh, Multiply. And then you see a picture of uh, Nasser there and Annie's there in, in the front. So they're there for uh, 10 days or so. And uh, just want to be praying for them for their safety. Uh, they're in a restricted country. Um, 
it's dangerous. They can't openly share their faith, but just want to pray. Uh, she also sent me a, a photo uh, of boxes of Bibles that had been sent to Europe that uh, they want to pass out to, to refugees that flee into that country. And so that's exciting to see that God's Word is going forth in a variety of different ways there. Um, so uh, there's a number of things we want to pray for. We want to pray for the Johnsons. We want to pray for Annie on her mission trip and others and just our time together this morning. So join me in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity, the freedom we have to gather uh, and worship you, our creator, our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we, we bow down before. We give you adoration this morning. Uh, God, we lift up brothers and sisters that have special needs. We lift up the Johnson family as uh, they sorrow and celebrate this day. They sorrow the, the passing of Ken, but celebrate the fact that he has stepped into your presence whole and complete. We pray you'd give strength and comfort, especially to Rita, who will miss him greatly, uh, as well as uh, the children and, and other family members. We just pray that they would sense your presence and that would give them strength and comfort during this time. We lift up Annie and we pray for physical and spiritual protection. We pray for uh, discernment for the entire team as they make contacts with people, as they visit with people, give them wisdom to know how to share uh, your truth and grace in ways that, that speak to their heart and that it would be receptive in ways that honor and glorify you. And now, Lord, as we open up your word, we pray that you would uh, speak to us, speak to our hearts and minds, uh, teach us and remind us of truths we need to hear uh, as we seek to, to follow you. We know that you tell us that if we draw close to you, you will draw close to each of us. And I pray that would be true for everyone who uh, is here this morning. So we commit our time to you for your honor in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever noticed how a negative experience can turn into a positive outcome? And maybe you've seen that uh, in history. Maybe you've even seen that in your own personal life. Let me share an example with you from American history, a familiar example. You probably have, have heard this before, uh, either in history or, or during other messages. Um, in the early 1900s, uh, the Deep South depended almost entirely on one crop for their livelihood, for their income, uh, for their uh, economy, and that crop was cotton. And that had cotton, you know, growing that and harvesting that had supplied all of their needs. But they also were aware, the flip side of that was that if, if the cotton crop ever, you know, was destroyed, their lives would be decimated and it would cause serious problems. Well, those fears turned into uh, a reality when they heard about a, a boll weevil epidemic that was sweeping through Mexico. It was headed toward Texas, and they was eventually uh, going across the, the southern United States. In 1915, the boll weevil epidemic hit Alabama and just devastated the entire cotton crop, and, and lives were, were devastated, it, creating a financial depression during that time. There was one farmer, however, in, in Enterprise, Alabama, that proposed a solution. And he said, said, people, we need to diversify our crops. And he suggested people planting peanuts. Well, at the same time, George Washington Carver, who was an agricultural scientist, was also discovering uh, different uses of peanuts. And so people were encouraged to plant peanuts. And they grew well. It was productive. They sold well. Uh, it, it helped turn their economy around. They were so grateful for, for that suggestion and that practice. And so they diversified their crops and it strengthened their lives and their economy. Uh, they also learned that it helped the soil for years growing simply cotton year after year had depleted nutrients in the soil and, and damaged the soil. And so by, by growing peanuts, it helped restore and uh, provide uh, nourishment for the soil. And that was a benefit. Um, 
And looking back on that experience, the residents in that area realized they could look back and say that that boll weevil epidemic was really the best thing that ever hit their region because that changed their whole economy. It diversified the opportunities for, for growing crops and gave them another way to earn income. Well, one businessman decided uh, he wanted to... Uh, commemorate the epidemic in sort of an odd way, and so he built a monument dedicated to the boll weevil. It is the only monument that uh, we know of dedicated that, to that insect, uh, and it is still up today. For over 100 years, tourists have driven to Enterprise, Alabama to see the monument that's been dedicated to the boll weevil. But when you think about it, that monument is a reminder of how a negative crisis was turned into a blessing in that region and, and in that state. And that has a direct parallel to what people in the Old Testament experienced because when people in the Old Testament experienced either a promise from God or they had a unique spiritual experience with God, they often commemorated that by creating a type of monument. And what they did was they took rocks. That's why we've passed out rocks to many of you this morning. And some, some of course, wondered if they were going to be able to throw the rocks at certain people. That's not going to be uh, encouraged this morning. Um, but in the Old Testament, people would gather rocks, and they would form either an altar of rocks, or they would just use one rock. Uh, and the rock would be a reminder of what God had done in their life. Let me share just a few examples from the Old Testament. Some of these may be familiar with you. Um, when God called Abram to be the father of the Jewish nation, when, the very early part of creation in the book of Genesis, in fact, Genesis 12, we're going to look at in just a moment. Um, we know that Abram later became Abraham uh, through a significant experience in his life. Uh, and I want you to notice how uh, Abram responds to uh, God's promise to him. Look with me in, in Genesis 12. We're going to look at uh, verse 2 and then 6 to 7. This is the promise God gave to Abram. And he said, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And so God led Abram from his native land, which is modern-day Iraq, led him to the land of Canaan. And he, got, he arrived in Canaan, and this is what happened. In verses 6 and 7, Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So God declares the land of Canaan, which we now know as Israel. Israel would be the promised land. Here was Abram's response. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. And so whenever Abram would see that altar, it would remind him, oh, this is, this is the site where God promised this land to give to me as well as my descendants. One other example related to Abram's, one of Abram's grandsons, Jacob, if you know the story, uh, when Jacob and his wife Rachel secretly fled away from Rachel's father, Laban, who Jacob had worked for for 20 years and, and had often cheated Jacob out of his wages and, and benefits in working for him, um, they secretly fled from Laban, and, and Laban chased after them, and he, he was upset that they were leaving secretly, but they also, he was upset that, that they had stolen some of his household gods, which they had done. But, but uh, Rachel sat on them and, and was, was hiding them, and they denied that. And so that led to an argument and conflict between Jacob and Laban, and they're talking, you know, the son-in-law and the father-in-law, they're talking back and forth and trying to reconcile things, and Laban saying, why did you leave secretly? You know, you've worked for me for 20 years. Why couldn't you tell me you were leaving? You're taking my daughter and you're taking my, my grandchildren away from me. And so they worked through that whole conflict and, and they decided, and, and they came to a point of reconciliation. They restored their relationship. 
And I want you to notice what they did to commemorate that restored relationship. In Genesis 31, verses 44 and 45, they look at one another and they say, come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. The verses that follow that explain that that stone was going to be a marker to remind them that neither of them would harm the other in the future. And so the stone was going to be uh, that memorial. Um, and so in the Old Testament, stones are often set up, set up as signs and mainly as, as reminders of what God has done in the past. When you see the sign, oh, that's what, that reminds us of, of God's work in our life, God's promise to us, or, or a relationship was restored, and that had future implications. And so our message today is simply entitled, Signs of God's Faithfulness. There is a sermon outlined in your bulletin, if, and as well as on the church app, if you want to take notes. Um, and the background of, of what I've shared, those incidents in Genesis, helps us understand today's passage. Last week, we saw in Joshua 3, how God miraculously stopped the flow of the Jordan River, which was at flood level, miraculous, miraculously stopped the flow of that so all of the Israelites, hundreds of thousands of them, could walk across the Jordan River on a dry riverbed as they entered into the land of Canaan. God miraculously led them into the promised land. And we read that in Joshua 3, verse 17. It says this, the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now, I want you to notice, let me also find to get to Joshua here. So here's all of, all of the Israelites have just miraculously crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. They, it was humanly, it was not possible for them to make it across. And I want you to notice how Joshua wants to celebrate that miracle among the Israelites. Look at chapter 4. You can follow along uh, either in your Bibles or on slides. I want to read the first seven verses. It says, when the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, from right, right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. A few weeks ago when we began this series in the book of Joshua, do you remember the, the overall theme of the Old Testament that I shared with you that morning? The overall theme of the entire Old Testament can be summarized by saying, God took a group of slaves and gave them some free land. God miraculously led the Hebrews who had been slaves in Egypt miraculously led them from slavery out of Egypt. And Jews commemorate that miracle and that event every year by observing what holiday? What observance? Passover. Every, Passover is celebrated every year as a reminder of the miracle of, a, of freedom from slavery. Okay? That's a, a great example of something in the past that is still practiced today. And so after 40 years, the Israelites are on the, the border of Canaan. Humanly, they cannot get across the river. And so God, once again, miraculously opens up a path to allow them to cross through the Jordan River into the land of Canaan. 
And God wants Israelites to remember that event also in their lives. And he does that by having, you know, uh, men gather stones together, set up uh, a pile of stones, set up an altar. Uh, we're, we're told in verse 7 that that pile of stones is going to serve as a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So when people saw those stones, it would re remind them of God's power and his faithfulness. Today we live by teachings of the New Testament. We don't, we don't make piles of stones anymore. But in a sense, I think we should. And what I mean is, I think we need to, we need to look at significant events in our spiritual life that have occurred in the past and connect them with some of God's promises and his power to us today. You see, I think God uses a number of different events to remind us of his work in our life. Uh, for me, uh, God has used different scripture verses that, that have solidified and, and, and displayed his, his power in my life, either, either speaking to me or revealing a truth or, or meeting a need. But sometimes God uses a, a song in a person's life. Uh, something occurs where God really does something powerful in a life and, they, and people connect that with a song and that song reminds them of, of God's work. For other people, it may be a location. Um, when, when my wife Annette goes to Heartland Camp, that's very significant for her spiritually because it was as a teenager at Heartland, she made a, a very serious re recommitment to the Lord and, and made a commitment to, to follow him wholeheartedly. And so every time Annette goes to Heartland Camp, she's reminded of, of that commitment she made. And that was a turning point in her life. So there, there may be locations for, for you. It may not be a camp. It may be the beach. It might be someone's home. It might be a person that really impacted you. Um, for some people, they have... They, uh, have a tattoo uh, put on their body as a reminder uh, of uh, what God has done in their life. People, God uses a variety of, of different ways to display his power, remind us of that. Let me give you examples from my life. Uh, in one sense, for me, Scripture has uh, are, have served like signs that have served as, as markers in my life that are really significant to me. Annette and I have been married now for 45 years. And I still remember when uh, she and I met in the pastor's office for premarital counseling. They, were, they had even begun that long ago back then. Uh, but I, I'll never forget, the pastor looked at us and he said, I want the two of you to select a verse or passage from Scripture that expresses your hope of marriage, your belief in marriage, and, and uh, uh, that's meaningful to you. And I will use that verse, and I will speak on that as, as the devotional at your wedding. And so we selected James 1.17. Let me show it to you. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So we selected James 1.17 as the theme for our wedding. We felt that each of us looked at each other as a gift from God. And so hundreds of people came to our wedding, and the pastor preached on that verse. And they heard all of them, you know, uh, what, the pastors, what the pastor preached about marriage is a gift from God, and, and we saw each other as, as gifts to each other. So that was 45 years ago. Every time I read James 1.17... Where do you think my mind goes? It goes right back to our wedding. It's a reminder. Oh, that's our wedding. I, I, look at, I claim that as our wedding verse, okay? And it reminds me of my commitment to treat Annette as a gift of God, okay? Um, that's 45 years ago. And so for the last 44 years of ministry, every time I've done a wedding, I've had a couple select a verse from the Bible or a passage, that is meaningful to them, and I speak on that at their wedding. Last month, if you were here for, for Dwight and Patricia's wedding, I asked them to select a verse that I would speak on, and they selected Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
That was the wedding devotional. That was the verse they had selected. So that's one example of how Scripture can be a powerful marker uh, in somebody's life. There is another life-changing event that uh, I experienced, which, which I've shared about numerous times. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details again, but that was the car, ex- car accident that I experienced a little, at this time, a little over 35 years ago. Um, but that accident in which I almost died changed my life, changed my marriage, changed my ministry. Uh, if you haven't heard details, let me give you just a very brief summary of that very quickly. I was driving in my Honda Accord, and I was driving uh, to, uh, really trying to drive to Santa Cruz because I was supposed to attend a board meeting, and uh, I got as far as Los Banos when a woman in a Chevy Blazer uh, was late for work. She's uh, doing about 70 miles an hour, lost control, and hit me head on. And when a Chevy Blazer hits a Honda Accord, the Honda Accord loses. Uh, And so she suffered a broken arm. I suffered uh, broken bones in 10 places, uh, broke both legs, broke my right elbow, had a concussion, double vision for months and other things. Um, I ended up spending three months in traction, five months learning to walk again, uh, and uh, experienced tremendous pain uh, out of that experience. But I remember, you know, when I finally realized what had happened, I don't remember the first 10 days, that's the miracle of drugs and God's mercy. Uh, So I can't tell you the the first 10 days that occurred in my life, which is a gift from God. Uh, But when I finally realized what had happened and how close to death I had come, I was praying. I remember I was in a hospital bed at home just praying and said, God, why did, why did you even spare my life? I mean, I had friends who drove by the car accident and did not know it was my car, did not know I was in the car because I was trapped in there for an hour. And they drove by, and one guy looked over and, and said to the driver, oh, keep going, that guy's dead. You know, those are my friends. And... Uh, uh, but that's what it had. It came very close to death. And, and so I'm praying. I said, God, I'm praying, God, why didn't you spare my life? I say, I came so close. You could have just taken me home. In fact, I was told by a friend months later that right after the accident occurred, there was a PG&E worker who saw the accident. He stopped. He ran over to my car, and I, I looked up at him. I, w- I was alert for a moment, and I cried out, and I said, God, take me home. And then I turned and passed out. Probably the last words I said, you know, before they finally pulled me out and, and flew me to the hospital. But, so I, I, you know, uh, so I said, God, why did you spare my life? And God gave me the answer one day as I was reading through Philippians chapter 1. Let me show you Philippians 1, 21 to 24. Paul talks about his life and, and death, and he says, for to me... He said, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. And once I read that, that was God's answer for me to my question. Why did you spare my life? And God made it very clear, Jim, I still have fruitful labor for you to do. And it's necessary for you to continue to remain in your church. And when I read that, that gave me, in the midst of you know, having to still recover and go through a lot of therapy and pain, that gave me a renewed commitment to ministry because of those verses. Because God still had work for me to do and wanted me to remain with, that, uh, with the church. So every, ever since then, whenever I have read Philippians 1, my mind goes back to that prayer, and I'm reminded, oh, this is why God spared my life in that car accident. And all those memories flood back, and it's God's promise to me. Let me, let's uh, uh, return to Joshua 4, then let's see what happens 
after the men collect their stone, carry it with them to where they camped that night, and, and the priests carry the ark across the river. Joshua 4, beginning at verse 19. Follow along as I read from 19 to the end of the chapter. On the tenth day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the twelve stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, In the future, when your descendants ask their parents, What do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Verse 19 says, The people went up from the Jordan River on the tenth day of the first month. Why is that date significant in the Old Testament? What other significant event occurred on that day in Old Testament history? History. Anybody know? It was what? Well, it was on that day when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. Tenth day of the first month, crossed the Red Sea and they crossed the Jordan River. Um, and so that why that is why that is really significant in Israel's history, and they remember that each year. And then we read, when future generations ask what these stones mean, tell them Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. God did that miracle for two reasons. Miraculously taking them across the Jordan River. One was to tell other nations about the power of the God of Israel. But also, it was a reminder for the Israelites, God has done this miracle for you, therefore fear him and obey him in the future. So when God works in our life, either to meet a need or answer a prayer or maybe reveal a truth to us, we appreciate that blessing. But the blessing isn't just for us. That blessing is to give us an opportunity to share with other people about the power of God, especially unbelievers. It also motivates us to walk and, and serve with him. And as God moves in our life, he wants us to, to share uh, good news with others is, so that good news is multiplied in the lives of other people, especially the, the next generation. The, the scripture verses I shared with you moments ago, those are like memorial stones in my life. They, they serve as reminders of how God moved in, in my life in the past and, uh, and gives me hope for uh, the future. But what about your life? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever looked back into life and, and thought of specific incidents where, where God has, has moved in your life or spoken to you? Because um, if you can think of something where, where God moved in your life in the past, that gives you confidence for the future. That gives you hope, and it strengthens your faith as we walk forward and trust him for uh, what happens in the, in the future. To, maybe, there's, maybe there's scripture verses for you that have been significant. Maybe there's events that occurred. Maybe there's people or when you think of certain songs, that that's a reminder to you of God's faithfulness and his power in your life. Um, I asked Elise if, if we could close today's service uh, with a song, a, a familiar hymn to, to many of us. Um, and I selected this song because of one phrase in it. The, the uh, hymn is entitled, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And I selected that hymn because uh, it won't be in our hymnal, but in the original writing of this hymn, verse 2 says, Here I raise my Ebenezer. Okay? Now, you mentioned Ebenezer to people today. And people think of Ebenezer Scrooge. Uh, and they think of the Christmas story. Um, but really, Ebenezer uh, comes out of the Old Testament, and it's related to uh, 
a powerful story of, of God's uh, working in the life of, of Israel. Um, in fact, I'll have you turn there if you want to. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, uh, Samuel challenges the Israelites to, to throw away their, their gods and, and worship only the Lord, and, and they make that commitment. And then Samuel says to them, I want you to meet me at Mitzvah, a nearby town, and I will pray for you. And so they head to Mitzvah. The Philistines hear that Israel is, is at Mitzvah, and they decide to attack Israel. And even though the Philistines are, are more powerful than the Israelites, God, God miraculously uh, helps Israel uh, to defeat the Philistines. And as a result of that victory, this is what Samuel does. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. The, the word Ebenezer literally means a stone of help. So that's why he named the stone Ebenezer. So whenever Israelites would see that stone near Mizpah, it would serve as a reminder of God helping them to be victorious over the Philistines. Okay. Um. And here's my challenge and encouragement to you, and the reason we passed out a stone to you this morning. If you can think of a time in your life when God helped you or God spoke to you, when God displayed his love or his power in your life. I want to challenge you to, to take your stone and when we start singing that song, Come Thou Font of Every Blessing, I want to encourage you to bring your stone forward and lay it on one of the steps here in front. Okay, Coming forward will be uh, an act of expressing thanks to God for his work in your life. Okay, And um, we'd like you to do that as soon as we start singing that song, especially during the first verse of Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, uh, because at this, when the second verse starts, the ushers are going to come forward and uh, collect offering and, and receive any connection cards you have to turn in, okay? Um, and so uh, what I'm encouraging you to do is, is if... God has done a work in your life. I want you to bring your stone forward, leave it on, on the step, uh, and that'll be an expression of expressing thanks to God. And then, after the service, when you're in the social hall having coffee and donuts, I want you to share with another person what that stone represents in your life. And by sharing what the stone means, and you... you uh, let me say this. If you see somebody carry a stone forward, you have my permission to go ask them what the stone means. Okay? So if you, and so by carrying, taking a, a stone forward, by sharing what that means, it'll confirm it in your heart, and it, it will be a way of encouraging faith, not only in your life, but in the life of another. So you have a chance to encourage one another. Uh, by expressing what that stone means. So I, I want to invite the worship team to come forward as they prepare to lead us for this last song. Ushers will come forward on verse 2. Join me in a word of prayer. God, we thank you for... Uh, this reminder in Joshua 4 of, of how Israel responded to you doing a miracle in their life uh, simply by, by collecting stones and putting them into a pile and having that serve as a reminder. God, we, I thank you for the many different ways you have moved in the lives of, of people here today. Uh, you've met a need. You answered a prayer. You you gave assurance to them of your love and grace. You displayed your power and, and love to them. May we express our gratitude by, by bringing rocks forward to just declare uh, your love and grace and your presence and power in our life. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to stand um, as we sing together and, 
uh, as we begin singing, let me invite uh, people to come forward if you'd like to leave a stone on the step.
Amen. Thank you to all that came forward. That staff meeting, Justin uh, offered a suggestion that we take all the stones that were brought forward and we glue them together and make them into a little altar. So that'll be his assignment this week. And, and uh, so when you come and you see it next Sunday, for people who weren't here, it'll give you an opportunity to tell them what that means. Oh, that's a sign of God's power and presence. And you can tell them what that means. Let's close by reciting it together. Uh, 1 John 1, 9. We'll recite this out loud together. Great verse. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. You're dismissed.